Welcome, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce three of our uh, graduates. Mohamed Hack, Matt Berge, uh, and then Joe Skowronski. Why don't we start by uh, each of you saying a few words uh, about where you are. Mohamed, you want to go first? Sure. Yes. So, hello, everybody. I'm Mohamed. Um, I am I'm a graduate of the DSA program. Uh, when did I graduate? 2020 April is what I want to say. Uh, I think I was the first graduate of this program. One of the first graduates. Yeah. yeah. So that's pretty fun. Um, I Right now, I'm working in Buffalo, but remotely from Canada. I'm a Canadian. Uh, fun fact. Um, I work remotely. I don't have a visa. That's why I work remotely. <laughs> um, and yeah, I work for a company called CCNY. And it's a not-for-profit organization that deals with doing data analytics for a lot of other not-for-profit organization. We also uh, oversee the children's system of care within Buffalo. And yeah, so that's what I'm doing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe Matt, you want to go next? Sure, I lied. I actually graduated December 2020. Mohammed made me realize that I had my year mixed up. There. When you said 2019, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a while. Uh, so I, I graduated then. Um, I am currently in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I moved here uh, about six months or so, three to six months after I graduated. Um, I am a fintech business intelligence engineer for Amazon. Um, I started as a uh, supply analyst for them as a contractor and then I converted full time in last November. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Joe. Yeah. So I graduated um, May of last year, May 2021. Um, shortly thereafter, I joined Carvana, where I work now as a senior data engineer. Uh, relocated to Phoenix a couple months ago and uh, just working here alongside a, a product analytics team. So actually, the 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 the, ho the the stars tonight, the hosts are the students. You're going to be uh, asking questions to our panelists because uh, I mean I, I I don't know what's in your mind. I don't know what you're curious to find out, and then uh, they'll just fill the beans. They'll you know tell us. They'll let you you know what. So uh, who who wants to go first? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you were kind of having to do functional programming. Was yes. that something that the companies kind of stylistically went for? No. So our organization is very much um, uh, base, basically we use tools when we need to, depending on what our external vendors want. So for example, one of our clients wants us to automate all of their reporting systems. So it is under my discretion on what I should use to do that. So, you know, mainly they have a SQL server. So I use C uh, SQL queries to hit their uh, database and then to formulate their reports, I use R because it's um, functional program is usually uh, simpler in the sense that it allows you to do a lot of very few lines of code. So when I need to like process, let's say 50 to 60 unique reports, um, I can get through a lot of the coding much faster than I would if I were to use Python because with Python, I would have to write out a lot more lines of code and it, it just builds, builds on top of each other and it just becomes very cumbersome in that point. Um, it is also the case that in our organization that we wanna have like a unified style guide, right? Um, like in our organization, there's very few an data analysts. Um, I think it's only three right now going to become two soon. Um, so because of that, it's it's very like important for us to keep a unified system. And a lot of it comes down to the individual's um, discretion. So, yeah, that's why I use R a lot more than Python. Okay, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What specific courses would you say are required to be competitive as a MSDSA graduate? Sure. Uh, I don't know what the current uh, courses are that are being offered there right now are, but I would say the type of course that I I 
found most useful what I currently do would be um, Barb's course, uh, which kind of introduced us into databases and SQL, uh, which I hadn't had any experience in prior to. And uh, also, I think I think we used we built our dashboards and pivot tables, but um, there was any any course that offered experience in Tableau too was, was very useful because I use SQL and Tableau to uh, to build dashboards and write custom SQL queries within it, um, and that's you know what I do on a daily basis. So I would I would say that course would, would make you pretty competitive. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, Joe. Of course, he's talking about because Barb wasn't teaching it. Is the DSA six ten right. class? The current so for our current Betsy. students wouldn't know who Barb right. was. <laughs> yeah, Be Betsy. Betsy uh, is teaching now. Okay, is that is that course still taught in this with the same exact yeah, ex exact exact same way? Very similar, and we've got very uh, very good feedback from the students. That was a game changer for me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, I, I think I would jump on and, and completely agree. I think, you know, the, the database course is instrumental. I, I don't think you're getting away from SQL and databases if you want to work in a, in a data analytics environment, whether it's as an engineer or a data scientist. Um, you know, as a data engineer, SQL is by far my most used tool. Um, so that's a big one. But I think uh, other courses to make you competitive, you know, they're going to somewhat depend on where you want to end up in your career as well. Um, you know, something like, like, like a business intelligence role where you're building dashboards, you know, the Tableau courses are going to be great. Uh, you know, machine learning engineer, uh, you're going to want to take, you know, the machine learning in Python courses, which I found fun. Um, and, and some of that, you know, you'll just learn over time what you need, depending on what you want to take your career forward. Thanks, uh, Mohammed. Um, I agree with both of them. The one thing, uh, I, and I know like uh, a lot of the students come from like different background. Uh, I know from the background I came from, I had a lot of experience with databases. So that course particularly did not uh, provide as much in the database side, but it did provide a lot on the, the data lifecycle side of things. Um, so even if you think you're not, if you think you know a lot about database or like you have the background, I would still suggest taking that course. The other course that I think is pretty instrumental in a lot of data related work is the data modeling that um, uh, is the TD gentleman, Matt. Oh, I Matt Nagowski. Matt Nagowski, yes. I think it, it, it might be the one on SAS where it was a lot of modeling that we did, a lot of like regression modeling, different types of modeling. We we did like time series data, uh, a lot yeah, of different. That one, yeah. yeah. And the reason I say that one is really important is because um, uh, I one of the things that I jumped into one of the first projects was a predictive model within our uh, within our uh, organization, and that course was instrumental to help me understand a lot of the backbones of the project. I wasn't necessarily the lead on that project, but I was you know helping a lot with uh, the coding and whatnot. So understanding the statistical side of things is, I would say, is really fundamental. And stats in general is really fundamental to a lot of uh, analytical work in data science, I would say. Stats. Yeah. So was that first part of the ACM? Well, no, the, the, the AC, that's a, that's a, a, a PACM course. Really. Yeah. It's ACM uh, 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 is 6, 12, 13, yeah. and 14. So it's a modeling with, with SAS. Maybe. Yeah. If any students do have a math undergraduate degree, we could potentially swap one of the DSA math classes. Right. So just come talk to us. Yeah, but the, 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 the one detail is that, that Mohammed has a background in mathematics. Yes, I do have a bachelor's in math. So if, if, if you don't have a bachelor's in math, then the course, the PACM courses, they may assume that you have complete fluency on the basics, uh, is calculus, differential equations. I think that course specifically, the, this doesn't, it doesn't much, really, right? uh, like a lot of the things that are introduced felt to me were like brand new and I didn't really need my background topic because yes, I have a bachelor's in math, but 90% of my courses that I took in my undergrad are computer science. And the, and it's only because I flunked out of computer science that I ended up with a math degree. And my last four math degree, math courses were linear algebra, two. So that's like 
well, the first thing linear algebra is you learn uh, geometry. Well, what's that going to help with? Yeah. Well, the, the logic in geometry, I think, <laughs> yeah, it really maybe. gives more than people think. Yeah, and actuarial science. Um, Which is advanced basic, probability. Yeah. It's actually a science probability. Oh, this is the basic one. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I just took it to finish my degree. <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> but, um, so good. Don't miss any yeah. math with Joaquim and Oro. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, definitely the success side of things. Uh, and just like, you know, brushing it up on your own is also like a good thing to do. We have another question from the chat. Um, are there any sources within yourself that motivate you to do your work and to learn new things in your career? How do you know that you're progressing? Okay, maybe, uh, Joe, do you want to start to scramble the order? Sources of motivation. I, honestly, I've always been interested personally in, in data related careers, data science. Um, you know, that was the main driver for me personally behind joining the DSA program. Um, you know, I, I love working with data, modifying data, uh, the predictive modeling and, you know, deep learning, which I've, I've dove into since the program is, is just fascinating to me. As, as far as knowing you're progressing, I think it's a lot easier in a, in a workplace environment than it is in an educational environment. Um, you, you know, education is really building on the things that you've done in prior courses. Um, but when you get into the workplace to be able to apply those skills and, and, really see what you've learned in, in a different environment, I think is helpful. And I think as you progress in your career, you kind of know, you know, you start to identify things that maybe you had to look up in the past or maybe things that you found difficult in the past that now are easy and the problems that you're solving are, are more difficult or, you know, you're able to mentor some people. So, so things like that, I think are really what drive progression in that standpoint. Great. Thanks, uh, Matt. Um, hmm. well, I really love my job, so I don't need a lot of help in that department. Uh, but I, hmm. I, I'm usually just very busy with tasks and, uh, and things that I'm asked for to build and do. So I don't know. It's, uh, how do I keep, I guess, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm motivated by how much I enjoy my job and what I do. So. Okay. Okay. I'm very uh, lucky. <laughs> well, have it. Um, I'll, I'm actually going to take a little bit of a different stance because I do lose motivation often. Um, and it's it's been like always been like something that always troubles me where like I get like super fired up and then like burn out and then just like lose the like lo lose a lot of the motivation. And I think uh, late, uh, earlier I hinted on the fact that I dropped out of computer science. That, that was one of the biggest reasons because I burnt out by the fourth year that I just but like I didn't want to do it. And I think one of the biggest thing is to not always to think about, you know, the next step, take some time to breathe because like, it or, like try to understand that this is like the first step and you don't have to like immediately jump and grind, grind, grind. Right. Because if you do that, you're going to start uh, losing that motivation. And uh, within our organization, that's like really like one of the biggest, um, ethos of our organization where it's like make sure you work hard but you don't you know you take a step back often enough to like let yourself breathe because if you don't let yourself breathe you're gonna lose that motivation and what i find often times is when i take that break i want to like i kind of want to like you know solve that problem again i want to like it, it it revs up my engine again and then that that's kind of how i like to segment my work is I like to do like, and um, yeah, that, that segmentation really drives my motivation, I would say. Yeah. Excellent. Now, I, I just realized that uh, Tom Bidney is here as well. And uh, uh, Tom, join the panel. I mean, uh, could you want to answer this question? Do you have a camera for one thing? Tom, are you there? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna call you out, Tom, but I, I was I was respectfully did it just for the record. Yeah, I didn't want to crash the alumni panel. I would, that's oh, not, absolutely. That absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever you would like, I can speak on anything. You, I well, think can you can you tell us me. about motivation? That, that's the question now. Yes. Um, just to give everybody a little insight, um, I graduated with Matt uh, in the same year or the same semester, I guess we'll say, and 
I got a job through Matt Nagowski, um, those ACM courses that we were discussing. He was a paramount in me getting a position at MT Bank. And I'm, I have a weird, bogus bank title, but I'm essentially a reporting analyst, I guess we'll just say. And um, I can tell you that often I do feel unmotivated with what I do. And I think it's very important to, barring this is a field that you're very interested in and you're passionate about, take time, take your own personal time to work on some projects that you may enjoy. And Muhammad is speaking to, you know, working on predictive um, projects, but mine is not. So I have to kind of motivate myself and pick up some of those personal projects in my own time, whether it be with Kegel or something else. I just need to figure out a way to keep my brain moving and motivated. And that's would be my suggestion. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let's move on to our next que uh, the move a question on, from the audience. I think we can hear you from here. Okay. I'm going to try to get loud. Yes. Um, my question is not directed towards anyone. Anyone can answer, really. Um, it's, did you have any experience in programming prior to being a student at Boston? And if you didn't, how long did it take for you to secure your first job or internship? Especially internship. Okay, uh, did everybody hear the question? Yes. Okay, so uh, anybody can start. Uh, Mohammed? Sure, I'll start. Um, I did have prior um, knowledge of programming. I, of course, came from a background from computer science. Um, in terms of my first, uh, I think I might be the worst one to ask for this because my internship was a little bit uh, wonky in the sense that, like, because I was Canadian, I had like this. And like, I was working as a grad assistant. I did like my internship with Buffalo State with Tiffany actually right here with our uh, department. I built, helped build a education dashboard, which then like culminated into like this big project that brought in multiple students. So I think I'm like the worst for that because- it Well, it's very, I mean, no, but every experience <laughs> is unique. Yeah, I way. kind of like created my own internship at Buff State. <laughs> Yeah, with the help of Tiffany. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it is definitely different. And I would say look outside because it is, um, there, there's a lot of folks that are hiring. Uh, even like uh, CCNY are looking for, um, always are looking for interns. Uh, we're actually hiring analysts. So um, without strong programming experience, so my background is in sociology, right? I see, I see. This is a huge transition for me. And again, there's also the culture of Barry and all of that, but it's not to it's not taking too much talk. But my focus is just I'm moving from the social science to, to the data to apply science. To apply science yeah, and absolutely. I love it. I honestly love the process. And personally, I prefer um the visualization part of data science. To the mining and all of that. I hate Python. <laughs> okay, what about that? I, do love wait, wait, wait. I like art. So I, I feel like okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I do enjoy art because art is more straightforward to me. Python, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so we're, we're offering I'm, both now, more and more. So yeah. That's what I'm really concerned. Summer internship for coming this is my first semester and I want to learn hands-on. Yeah, for sure. I would say like Definitely, like one of the biggest uh, things that I did was, and this is gonna be funny. YouTube, YouTube has like been instrumental. Like before I joined the DSA program, the, um, I would just watch like YouTube t tutorials on like Python, and I would like like code along with them, right? Um, in fact, uh, the thing I built for Tiffany when we were discussing the kind of tools we're going to use, like set up a server, I'm like, I've never done that in Python. Set up a website in Python, I've never done that. But hey, I'll just uh, look up that YouTube tutorial and just like do it with them, and then like figure out the steps uh, that way. And it's a, uh, um, I think like the previous question with motivation is like finding those like time for yourself to work on small projects, and it doesn't have to be like really complicated projects, right? Uh, learning to program is really tough initially, but then once like something clicks and this feeling I feel like happens to any computer science student I've talked to um, that are like starting as computer science without any uh, programming background, there's always that click. And that when that happens, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, 
So that's programming. I get it now. Uh, but you have to have that, um, you know, trial and error process. There's going to be a lot of failures, but you can't let those failures uh, push you down for sure. Great, thanks. Uh, one of the other panelists, uh, Matt. Uh, yeah, with the question was, did I have any previous program experience? Yes. No. <laughs> I was, uh... <laughs> okay, so you're, you're a great example because you are in the same boat as she is. So how did you handle it? How long did it take for you to become fluent and get an internship and all that stuff? Uh, I struggled. I struggled a lot, actually. Um, I, I asked for help. I, I stayed up. Uh, actually, I, I, I won't forget the night that I, uh, I stayed up uh, at school late in the very beginning with Mohammed. So we became kind of close. Um, I was I was really struggling with programming in the beginning because I had no background. I come from a, a real estate background, uh, property management ownership. So, I mean, this was something completely different for me. Um, but, you know, I, I, you get better over time. You know, you practice and um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of questions, a lot of emails to uh, Joaquin asking questions about things, you know, just working with other students, asking questions and learning. But I, I had no background with that whatsoever. No, no background in computer programming, databases, anything like that. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, hey, Joe. Yeah, so I had a, a little bit of a background, uh, mostly with SQL and databases. And, and I was one of those people that kind of had an interest in it. So I would start, you know, kind of following some tutorials, kind of like Mama was talking about, just tutorials for, for random stuff, not necessarily um, you know, Python for data science or anything like that, but just, you know, various web programming, JavaScript, stuff like that, just, just things I was interested in. So I had some kind of background when it came to, to that sort of thing. Um, but I think kind of going back to, to what Muhammad was talking about with programming in general, well, once things start to click and you start to, to feel more comfortable with it too, um, you know, knowing the right questions to ask Google when it comes to programming is extremely helpful. You know, if you know what, if you know what you're looking for, or you can at least kind of logically think about what you want, Google can usually tell you the answer. Pizza is a trick also. We see you there. I think I told this story to everybody here. I, and I keep repeating it. Yeah. When I first started learning programming. And I got my first uh, co-op uh, job in like first year university. I did not know much about like, you know, web dev or anything, but I got a job as a web dev somehow. Um, uh, I signed up for a website called Stack Overflow where you ask questions. And within the first week I got banned for asking stupid questions. <laughs> um, they permanently banned my account. I'm like, oh, I guess I am stupid. They let it up eventually, right? Huh? You're permanently banned. Forever? You, yeah, well, I use my work work email address, so I had I made another account very fast <laughs> with a different email address and started asking not as stupid questions, but like still pretty stupid because like my average uh, upvotes were like minus thirty, minus fifty, or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's not that good of a site, but what I'm trying to say is you will always ask stupid questions at the start. And that's why people like Joaquin, uh, your peers that have experience are your best resources, in my opinion, because especially like the professors, if you think you're annoying them, you're not even close to annoying them. That's how I like that's right. to think. That's right. Right? If you're like, oh man, if I ask this question, I keep asking, I feel like you're not annoying them at all. They're, they're, they're trying to get you to succeed. So ask those questions and until you understand it. Are you sure, Mr. Carbonara? Oh, yes. <laughs> we just zoomed at 2 o'clock, went to class at 3 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sent my professor so many emails, Wendy and Joaquim. I'm surprised they even responded to the, the amount of emails that I sent. That. It was, Tom, it was Tom what about, can, can you tell us a little bit about your case? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to Well, I had a little bit of experience. My bachelor, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, but um, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but my argument for learning or what I would suggest to learn programming is find something that interests you. Ask a, More importantly, ask a question that's interesting to you and then figure out how to get to the answer of that question, whether it be 
I, I think I heard maybe sociology. I'm not sure. I, I don't claim to know anything about sociology, if that's what it is. But find a question that you would want answered and then, you know, hunt for the data source. Find a way. You'll, you'll start digging through. You'll start finding things out. And depending on what tool you're using, you may end up, you know, Stack Overflow. I, I was in the chat with you, Muhammad. I agree 100%. It, it'll be your best friend. But you will then end up asking the questions of, oh, I want to get to this answer. How do I get there? And it's, it's sort of like an iterative process. So my answer will almost always be find your passion and it'll help you learn. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, do you have any, any other questions that we should prioritize here? That are... Do you do a lot of work with predictive models? Um, this is from Mike. Um, he is currently a BI analyst and is familiar with SQL, but is wondering how to break into more predictive analytics. Okay, predictive analytics. Okay, that's a question. Do you do any of it? How to break into it? Oh, uh, one of our biggest, uh, was a million dollar contract is uh, part of, uh, is doing a predictive, uh, bleh, predictive analysis on uh, children's system of care. In fact, it's going to be the first one being in implemented in all of the United States. So that's really wow. exciting. Um, I worked on more of the uh, visualization and the data manipulation side, but Usually, um, the, when I joined, we have like a statistician by uh, by profession. She's a PhD in statistics, so like insanely smart. Um, she's the one. Uh, her and uh, one of the other data engineers. They are like you know they've done a lot of predictive model, and I was added on as like a help to them. So I was able to learn a lot just by being in the presence of a lot of folks that are doing this work. So I learned like oh, all the different tests that they were doing. And my goodness, like the way that they're like handling each individual variables uh, with like, a pr like needle precision. And the data is so messy. Oh my God. It takes about like three hours just to clean up the data. Um, it, and this is an automatic script that's running in the background. It takes about three oh. hours for that script to clean up the data. That's how messy it is. It's like pulling from like 10 to 20 like different data bases. And it's like trying to merge everything into like this one giant, like, you know, uh, when you're doing any kind of like predictive model, you need to bring all of your data into one big table and categorize them. So like to do all of that and to bring build this gigantic matrix of data, it just takes so long. But we've I've learned all of this by just you know being with individuals that are key. And mind you, if you don't know and you're applying for a job, still apply for that job because a lot of these techniques you can't learn outside of a job, outside of a job. So they are there to teach you. They will teach you. So don't be scared of like, ooh, predictive models, ooh, uh, uh, big data stuff. They will teach you. Yep. And it's their job to teach you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Um, I, I did it a lot in my internship and professional lab, but I haven't done it since. But it was integral in that. If, if I hadn't taken the course, I think it was it was CIS 512 with Suman Lada. Is that the, yeah. the course? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that course I, I used directly with my project in and I just want to say that that was a, that's been a huge talking point, and well, was a huge talking point in a lot of my interviews. Um, speaking about that project, um, predictive analytics, and and what was what I did in my professional lab and my internship, um, I, I don't think I would have got the job I got if I wasn't able to talk about those things. So that even though I don't use it now, it was it was something that was very important in, into getting me where I am. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I have a question here. Um, did you guys take any of the JS courses? And if so, like, do you use this in your jobs at all? So geographical information system courses, did you take them and how useful are they? Oh, yeah. One of my favorite courses. <laughs> Your favorite courses? Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, any comments? Any more? Uh, it was so much fun. Um, but it is definitely uh, Python heavy. I think, from what I remember, uh, yeah. ArcGIS within Python. Um, but yeah, I don't use it now, per se. But it is like I have all the notes saved because I know I can pull that out in like, I w like if I have to do any specific project that requires me to do like 
reports that are like to pinpoint any kind of uh, patterns within with location data. Um, I feel very confident into like, you know, I can put in like geo data from census and build like uh, data storehouse that gets like that pulls the data and builds reports based on like your geo data. And I can do a lot of like cross joins with geo, geo data, which is like really, really good stuff. But it is a tough course, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I loved the GIS course myself. Uh, my undergrad was actually focused on GIS, so I've got quite a bit of experience there. Um, I don't use it currently, but I, I did use a lot of that type of work in, in one of my previous positions, working with uh, like point location data and plotting that on a map to, uh, to, to build up environmental variables that we're using in some of our modeling. Um, so it definitely has its uses. It is definitely Python heavy, and uh, you know I feel like it might be on the more difficult side to work with, but it's it's a lot of fun. Great, uh, Matt. Uh, was that the course Dr. Mix taught? Yes, indeed. Okay, okay, yes. I I took uh, one of her courses over the summer. That was probably one of my favorite courses, actually. Again, I, I used it in my internship in my professional lab. Uh, with geospatial visualizations, again, a big talking point in a lot of my interviews that I had. So uh, I, I think that that course and, and the predictive analytics course are, are super, super integral and important. Great, thanks. Tom? Don't currently use it, but uh, Matt can tell you stories of him and I working on projects until one in the morning <laughs> in that course. But, but like you said, um, anything... I had a lot of projects as well that I showed various people. The the zombie house project i don't know where that is or what's happening with that currently but matt and i were in that together and i have brought that up in numerous interviews now not so much anymore of course but at the time it was the internship was was great by the way i, I may take this opportunity to advertise that uh, the zombie project that he's talking about is with the uh, uh, third estate ventures and they uh, are eager to take more students uh, and uh, the, the the person running it uh, is is very very committed, very dedicated. He really uh, makes it easy and pleasant to work, and he works a lot with data um, it, within the area. Loca I mean, with geography and, uh, and 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 data in Buffalo to to come up with all kind of interesting um, uh, information that he mines. And he's a lawyer, so they use it for for the good of the community. So if anybody uh, is thinking on doing their project or, or I mean the professional lab of the internship, uh, they should consider that, that, that opportunity, that option. Another question. Um, what are the biggest issues you face working with data? The biggest issue, uh, issues working with data. Who wants to go first? Dirty data. And dirty data. It's always <laughs> dirty <laughs> data. <laughs> never it's never nice and easy you know and then there's I, I have issues sometimes with you know data that i think is something and then i work with it for a while it becomes unreliable um but data i mean depending on the size of the company you work in and my company is very big so there's a lot of different teams that are required to do things and when when there is an issue with the data like i have to go through hoops to get it corrected and explain it to like a bunch of different people and open up tickets to multiple different departments so it's yeah it's it's all root the root cause of it all though is, is dirty data and um usually i don't know for me at least a lot of people i work with they don't really understand the data on the technical side so it's even difficult to explain sometimes what you need and, and how you need it fixed it's it, it, it goes down a whole rabbit hole so but it, it's all rooted from dirty data for sure i'm working on a project this second it's actually on my work computer right next to me where I'm supposed to combine data um, basically on account numbers uh, in different platforms that we use at M&T. And I have one account is showing up nine times. That's not supposed to happen. So yeah, that's the biggest issue for sure, 100%. Yeah, I, I had a whole data set the other day that I found was ruined because they put a, a select distinct in it. And, and there was a potential for duplicate things that were not actually duplicated in that data set. It just like erased half the data set and and no one would have got it. But I was like, that's not right. And it was just a simple select distinct. And, you know, just you just have to be really careful. And I mean, 
Barb, you know, was was very critical of like when she taught that course, how specific, how detailed you had to be. Like every every statement you wrote could mean like a bunch of different things, and just being like really critical as to what your logical thought process was. And and it, it's very true in in the real world. For me, it's a bit different. Um, dirty data is going to be everywhere, so I don't really think of it as a challenge, more so as a process of or just like a artifact of what it is. Uh, one of the things, like the biggest challenge for me is, especially working for a smaller organization, um, is, is the data discovery part portion of any data related project with a, an external vendor. So anytime we start a project for somebody else, uh, they give us all of their, you know, data related access and whatnot. And then, so I have to like spend hours just trying to understand their data, you know, reading all their guides, reading all their manual, making sure everything's good, and then implementing that with our systems. I find that to be the most challenging because it's like, it's like you're like learning a new language every time we have a new project. And it's, it is, it's that headache that like keeps me up at night sometimes. I'm like, oh, what is this? There, and yeah, it, and it it it, it kind of ties back to data cleanliness, but the definition of cleanliness is different for different people. We have this organization that keeps everything in one big table, but it's not necessarily a wrong thing that they're doing because it, these are so-called different types of documents. The issue, this is where the data cleanliness comes in. They can mark the documents by typing. How do we now you know, categorize things that are handwritten, right? So that's when things get really, really messy. And it's just, you know, utilizing other folks' data is really tough. And that's the thing that I find to be the most challenging. Philippe, taking on uh, on, on your, uh, I mean, a definition of, of uh, dirty data that is different for everybody, mm -hmm. uh, once we started talking about it among the people creating courses, we realized that there is so much more than that we thought that we mm -hmm. should create a course just on data cleaning. I, I, I agree with that. Um, definitely, this is this program is, is relatively new, but this program offers a lot of like cool insights, but there are some things that like, gaps that like no other like nobody has started doing it yeah, we should do <laughs> yeah, we, we, are like a, we should definitely <laughs> take on so uh mm -hmm. but also the, the other thing about uh, cleaning the data is that when the, people don't know what they want to do with the data and the data depends very much on, on many factors so we, we learned about things like the standards like hl7 mm -hmm. from what our faculty work with medical industry so they they uh, the data from the beginning is collected to fit the usage and so HL7 and the standard that they follow and uh, and so on that there could be other standards created yeah. that would make uh, life easier. I think that we do not understand. I'm, I'm data also yet. part of like the medical sector. Uh, yeah. Some of the works I do as medical and nobody follows that. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just a little little bit of a hint. You yes. think you think that they would. Oh my goodness. Um, com uh, complacency is huge, especially like, uh, and it, it's, it's a human, it's a human problem. So it's something that we cannot solve. We just have to work around it. Yeah. But people, oh. people do what they know and, yeah. and what is, what they don't know well, they don't want to use it. Yeah. But, um, you have things like if, if like, let's say, uh, an organizer organization loses funding, right? So now they, uh, kick out all the, like high paying folks and then they bring in interns to their job without any training all of a sudden the data that you're getting right. is dirty and now us the reporting agency have to suffer for that um this is an exact scenario by the way <laughs> <laughs> um these are the things that is 100 percent out of our control no matter how much we try we can't really um we can't really like you know prepare for that, right? Um, especially the type of data this is. I can't talk about the type of type of data because then I would be fined and thrown in jail for uh, breach breach of uh, legal whatever disclosures, yeah, and disclosure and all that. Uh, but because of that, you 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 really have to like focus in on trying your best, and you know it's it's gonna break, and you just have to deal with it. Have have a contingency plan. What it does. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More questions. So are any of the alumni working on any secret solo projects? Are ah. you guys going to the next Steve, Steve Jobs of <laughs> any, any who wants to go first? Matt? I'm not. You're done. You're not. No, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. No. Joe, Joe, when he was working, he 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 uh, his internship was on this machine learning pro uh, project to to try to predict which poles were needed to be replaced, and yeah. uh, uh, that that impressed a, a lot of people. That I, I can say, wow, that's a pretty interesting use of machine learning. And uh, uh, so, um, in any case, has anybody followed up on have their own secret projects that you want to tell us so that we scoop you on it? Um, <laughs> I did have a project that fell through. Ah. It was a secret project, but then it fell through because another, uh, it was like, oh, cool, we'll be the first one to do it. But uh, as, as like, we're like at the infancy of our development. And then an app was released. That's exactly oh. that we were thinking of. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, it was basically, um, it's called, we named it Auto Music Director. And what it did was um, when you have, like, I, I was in a choir, right? And what I wanted to do is make sure, like, a choir is, like, you know, singing properly. So what it did was it, it would listen to, like, audio and it would tell you what chord is being played currently oh, cool. um, using machine learning uh, because there's a lot of, like, data out there that I could just like you know, teach it with um, because I didn't want to do Fourier transformation and that is very annoying <laughs> but um, yeah so that, that that was our secret project and then lo and behold somebody released it while we were in development and I'm like ah. <laughs> well talk, one project that uh, one of our partners wanted to do with, with the students that we haven't been able to find students today right now he wanted to do an app that uh, when you are cutting people's hair, you put the the, app, the, the the phone next to the person and then automatically recognizes the face and then you can cut following a design on their app. Wow. I said, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> that, that, that's a, more of a computer science. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's, not, it's not a exactly. data. It's not really a data I mean, science. It does have data portions of it, but it's a lot like a well, merge it, of the two. It's, yeah. it, you require a lot of... but but. You, there is a, there are packages, for instance, mm -hmm. because you have, to, you have to have face recognition, image recognition, yeah. training it. So it could be done actually with with packaged stuff. Yeah. yeah. But you need to be really fluent with different platforms and uh, machine learning and so on. That's. But there are all kind of crazy projects. But another project that actually took off, I saw, in, is these these guys that. Um, they they uh, put a survey, so you subscribe to the service. You, you put us, you, you you tell somebody you want to give a present, and then you say everything about that person that you know, and they will tell you what to buy. I, I see, but but it's all done with artificial intelligence, though. Yeah, and uh, uh, that is you you. When I heard about it, <laughs> this is a crazy secret project, but but actually it's not so bad because I mean. It's really hard to give people good presents, <laughs> and, uh, and and so on. There are all kind of crazy projects out there, and uh, waiting for you to to discover and carry them out. That's all the questions that I have. Okay, let's see. My, well, uh, let, let me see what are the questions. Oh, six fifty. Yeah. So okay, so why don't we? Tomorrow. Yeah, why don't we wrap things up? Why don't each of the panelists? Uh, give one word of advice, and then we we call it a night. And uh... I was actually thinking about that before this. I, I think really the biggest thing. I mean, obviously the, the journey going through everything. You know, the courses. Regardless of what you take, you know, you're gonna you're gonna struggle a little bit. You're gonna learn. You're gonna be you know involved in it, and the, your your thought process is gonna be molded. But I think thinking towards like my interviews and actually getting the jobs. You know, once you're out of once you graduate, you know, the, the the internships and the professional labs, I think, are really, really important. So I think that, you know, the more effort and the more you make out of it, um, regardless of what it is, just like, making it the best you can and, and working on it the best you can is, is going to be really important because it's going to drive conversations in your, in your interviews. So, you know, just m make sure that you take it seriously and uh, you put a lot of effort in it and make it, make it something great regardless. Thanks. Uh, 
Hey, Tom, do you want to go next? Sorry, I was going to go first, but I crashed the panel, so I didn't want to. Um, this isn't necessarily DSA related, but I would say the most obvious is network, 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 network. I had an internship. In addition to that one, I found an internship at um, Delaware North. And I. the only reason I even had an opportunity there was because of a classmate of mine who had had an internship before I, I did. And then after taking that class with Matt Nagowski, again, I will sing his praises for the rest of time. He, him and I kept in contact after I graduated. He asked me how the job hunt was going and if he could help in any way. He directly affected me getting in contact with a recruiter for MT. And yeah, not every interview at MT went went swimmingly, hence why I, I didn't get those positions. But I would not have gotten my job without him helping me the entire way. So I think these are important. That's the reason I crashed it. I, I think they're very important to, to stay in contact with the people that you're in class with. And who knows, you may have a professor that has an opening at a position that they work in or whatever it may be. So network, network, network. Yeah, Thanks. That reminds me of something. That reminds me of something too. I'm sure Joaquin wrote me a bunch of good recommendations. So you know, really putting in that effort and showing your professors that you know you care, you're passionate, is important too. Because yeah, I yeah. I, I don't know what he wrote exactly, but I, I know <laughs> he, he had to he had to write a lot of good things because I got a lot of jobs that I probably shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> you still have the panel, uh, the professional. The uh, what's advisory it board? Advisory board. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and and they are very, very willing That's to help. That's how I got my job. <laughs> the advisory. Board. Yes. Yeah. No, they are great. They are really committed. Yes. They are. They are I mean, they are extremely connected. As co well. Connected. I mean, but I'm amazed of, of how. I mean, I didn't really. Why would people from industry be so committed and so loyal? But they are. Yeah. I mean, it's like they 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 want the the, the profession to grow and they want to do networking and so they they are great. So for our newer students, if any of them don't know this, all of our board members are listed on the website under people, wait, under, no, under the, um, the board. Um, so if you go on there and there's a company you're interested in or a position that you're interested in, send me an email and I can see if they're okay with me sharing their contact information. And I've literally never had a single one of them say no. So. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Uh, Joe, do you want to go next? Yeah, there's a lot that has already been said, and I, I think it's all fantastic advice. Um, definitely, as you're going through your, your, your coursework and, and the DSA program, you know, take note of the challenges, the failures, the triumphs. Um, everything that you learn is going to be a fantastic learning experience, but also a fantastic talking point when you do get around to interviewing and being able to, to talk through the projects, but not just you know, your successes, but also your failures and what you've learned through those failures is, is unbelievable to talk through during an interview. So I think that's super important. I'd also suggest, you know, spend some time outside of the classroom and outside of your coursework to, you know, do, do things that interest you. It doesn't have to be data science related. It could be straight tech related. It could be reading, you know, statistics papers, research papers, things like that. Um, just again, as, as another talking point to kind of deepen your knowledge and, and give yourself more to talk about in an interview. And then it's been said multiple times, you know, network, attend events like these, reach out to, to anybody and everybody that you can, you know, grow your connections on LinkedIn, your, your personal connections. Um, I too, my previous opportunity was a, a direct um, result of networking with a former coworker that just so happened to have an, an open engineer position on his team. So it's it's a fantastic thing to do, and you know, just like everybody else said, I'll I'll drop my uh, my info in the chat. Feel free to reach out. Any questions, advice, uh, referrals? Carvana is hiring like crazy. Um, you, you would have to move though. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, um, save your notes for real, <laughs> for real. Especially those stats notes uh, from uh, Ghost Ghost's class. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I still have my little book with all my notes and I, I'm really bad at stats. Okay. I might've done well in the course, but that's only because notes, <laughs> um, 
I go back to my notes whenever like, oh, damn, what test goes here? Oh, yeah, I have this like little flow chart of, uh, okay, is it this? Is it this? No, is it this? Is it, okay, oh, that, that's the test I need. Okay, cool. <laughs> Apply this test to this uh, model. Um, it's so useful. Um, one thing like, uh, especially like this program is very applicable. A lot of the things that you learn here, extremely applicable. So that's why I would say keep those notes. They'll definitely be of assistance, especially when you're, you know, going forward to uh, into the industry. And I didn't, I didn't really give an advice about getting the job because that is the main advice right there that was given is, you know, make that connection. Because I got my job from Kim Harrington. Um, she has this biannual uh, business intelligence talk. And I'm like, you know, I would always go to these talks and um, they would have like this uh, breakout rooms. And then I was broken up into one of the CCNY employee. And she was like, yeah, we're hiring. And I'm like, cool, I'm going to contact you after this. And I did. And I got the job. <laughs> so, and yeah, and you can, when you go to these events, these Buff State events, you can always talk to the board members and they become excellent referrals. And just, you know, cultivating that um, community is excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure to have uh, all of you here. And uh, we'll see you at the next uh, seminar and in classes and around. And we'll continue networking.